Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday School class today. Uh, let's, let's look to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege it is to not only read but to study your word. And then, Lord, the power that your spirit gives us to understand it and to live it out. I pray we might be good ambassadors for you as we understand more clearly the word you've given to us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to our Sunday school. Uh, how do you do with your homework? Uh, I guess I was going to start calling it enrichment or going for the gold exercise. Uh, it was to read the book of Philippians in one sitting, pretending you're a member of the church at Philippi. Uh, having pretty much the first 11 verses of chapter 2 down pat. So you could be whisked away from your time and your town here on the eastern shore to another place in a distant land some 2,000 years ago and understand God's word as they understood it. That's the beauty of the way God orchestrated and the way God worked through his word. Although we have to do a little bit of digging and historic research to find out some things, yet what he says and what he asks us to do is very relevant for today's society. Now remember, it's not the Bible that needs to change. It's the way we look at it that needs to change. So let's put on our good context lenses. I'll give you some quotes that talk about contextualism, okay? The context of Bible verse. Very, very important. If you say, give me a hand, I don't know if I'm supposed to go shop for bananas or if you're stuck and need me to reach out and help you or if you want me to applaud what you're doing uh, or go hire somebody to be your hired hand. I don't know what it is except for the context that I can both visualize and hear. So context is important. One person says, uh, John Shelby Spong, when I grew up in the South, I was taught that segregation was the will of God. And the Bible was quoted to prove it. I was taught that women were by nature inferior to men. And the Bible was quoted to prove it. I was taught that it was okay to hate other religions, and especially the Jews. And the Bible was quoted to prove it. Well, wow. we've heard some sermons that were way off base, not here, praise God, that were way off base, maybe on the radio or in traveling, and we thought, wow, how did they get that from the Word of God? Oprah Winfrey, uh, in her 20s, working as a reporter for, uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, for WJZ-TV, going at the time, attending the Beth Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church, one Sunday morning, she was listening to the pastor, Reverend John Richard Bryant, and he was expositing the fact that God is a jealous God from Exodus 20, 15. Winfrey, from that moment on, changed her whole ideas about a Bible-believing church that she grew up in. Here's what she says about that moment thinking back and recalling that moment when she was 20 years old. Now, why would God, who is omnipotent, who has everything, who is able to create me, and I'm quoting her, raise the sun every morning, why would this God be jealous of anything that I have to say or be threatened by a question I would ask? And she said, and from that moment on, I wanted nothing to do with this God of the Bible. I started my spiritual journey toward myself. Wow, all over a misunderstanding, over a word. Now, when we think of jealousy, we're never thinking it's a good thing. But if we think of the kind of jealousy that the Bible explains, and we do some word study and some contextualizing, we will understand that it's not the petty jealousy that we might have, it's not that enclosure of somebody and not letting them breathe. It's the kind of jealousy I have for my children when I see them nearing the edge of a pit 
that they could fall in and be killed. It's a jealousy for their life to not let the circumstances prevail. And that's the kind of jealousy that God has for us. At any rate, just because the Bible says something doesn't make it truth. If what you are saying from the Bible is slanted, distorted, misapplied, or merely the letter of the word. So you got to be careful about who you listen to uh, when it comes to the Bible. The greatest proof that the Bible is inspired is that it has stood so much bad preaching. A.T. Robertson, the writer of those word studies I told you, uh, says there might be a lot of bad preaching out there. Any part of the human body can only be properly explained in reference to the whole body. And any part of the Bible can only be properly explained in reference to the whole Bible. Our medical community has taken great steps forward decades ago when they went to holistic thinking about how to handle the body. And so when we think about holistic thinking when it comes to the Bible, it all has to hang together. It all came from the same creator. Scripture is the best interpreter of Scripture. The locks of Scripture are only to be opened with the keys of Scripture. And there is no lock in the whole Bible which God meant us to open without a key to fit somewhere in the Bible. And we are to search for it until we find it. From the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon. With the Holy Spirit, who authored the Scriptures for the purpose of their being our infallible guide, promote them as a grab, grab bag of all kinds of meaning. Led by the Spirit by Jim Eliff. The point here is, why would the Holy Spirit just give us the Bible, which could mean anything I wanted it to mean, and any verse could mean any of 20 things, depending on who was reading it. Why would he do that if his job is to illumine us so that we can be led by this map of God's word? Any road isn't going to get me the truth. I hold that the words of Scripture were intended to have one definite sense and adhere rigidly to it. To say the words do mean a thing merely because they can be tortured into meaning it is a most dishonorable and dangerous way of handling Scripture. J.C. Ryle. Readers of the Bible must be prepared to have their values and beliefs called into question by the text. If they are not, they will grasp the Bible in the wrong way, twisting its words so that they conform to what we want them to say. This is from Deval and Hayes, the writer of a textbook I teach from on biblical hermeneutics. Peter, speaking of the Apostle Paul, states, He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters, speaking of the end times. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant, ignorant are people who maybe are newly saved or their children, uh, they might be people who can't even read yet, and unstable, people who listen to this preacher here and this preacher here and this preacher here and read this article here and this article here and they're all coming from different angles about the Word of God and confusion reigns supreme. They're not sure what to believe. Well, God says that both of these kinds of people twist, distort, or rest, W-R-E-S-T, the scriptures as they do the other scriptures and they do it to their own destruction. So if we're not careful, wrong ideas about what the Bible is saying can destroy. It's not going to take me to hell if I'm a saved person, but it can destroy my ability to live the Christian life the way God wanted me to live it. The truth is, it doesn't matter what a verse means to me, to you, or to anyone else. All that matters is what the verse means from John MacArthur in a book called Charismatic Chaos. So let's get some good context lenses. Okay, let's do a word study quickly on the word worry. Let's begin with the use of take thought in Matthew. It is found in verses 25, 34 of 6, and 10, 19. And in Luke, it is found in 12, 11, and 22. It's the Greek word merim nao, and this word, this Greek word is used 25 times 
in the New Testament. Now, a Greek word, like our English words, can mean a whole lot of different things. So we're going to look at Philippians 4, 6 when we get finished this little word study and contextual study. We're going to look at that and try to figure out what it means there. Okay, let's go to the, the first five uses here. Therefore, I say unto you, take thought. But he puts a negative there, take no thought. But take thought is the word merimnao, for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Therefore, take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. But when they deliver you, take no thought for what, how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you that same hour what you shall speak. So here he's saying, don't take thought for these things, okay? Don't care about these things. Life, eating, drinking, body, clothing, uh, adding to your stature. You're too short, too tall. Uh, he says, life is more than food, the body more than raiment. Uh, and tomorrow, don't worry about tomorrow, just live for today. There were people here on a missions trip. And uh, one question of our students was asking this team of missionaries, so to speak, uh, what do you do when you go to the foreign field to help missionaries? And one of their answers was, savor every minute. Don't be in a situation worrying or concerned about the next situation coming up. Savor, be present in every moment. And that's basically what God is saying. Be pre He's not saying don't make plans for tomorrow, but don't worry about them. Be present, live for the moment. Tomorrow may not come for one reason or another. But then there's this last one found in Matthew 10, 19, where they're, the disciples are getting ready to take a mi missions trip. And Jesus says now, when, um, when on that missions trip, they report you for your activities. And then when you're arrested, don't worry about your defense. Don't worry about getting an attorney or your defense. The Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. At that time, at that moment, you'll have them. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto your magistrates and unto the powers, take no thought or what, what you shall say or what you shall answer, uh, Luke 12, 11. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on. So are all these kind of thoughts and cares things that we shouldn't have according to the scriptures we've read? Yes. Yes. Now, let's look at the same Greek word, merimnao, translated cares for. Uh, it appears four times in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 32 through 34. It's the same Greek word. He says, But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Now let me tell you what this is not saying. And it can't be saying, and you know it can't be saying this because of what God said. When God got finished all of creation, there was one thing that wasn't good. Remember, day after day he said, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. Do you remember what he created that wasn't good? Think about it for a minute. It was Adam. He said, hmm, this is not good. A man all by himself is not good. And all the ladies in the world are saying amen to that. <laughs> no good. I will make a meat, perfectly, uh, a help, perfectly meet 
for him. And so, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is not coming along and saying it's better to be unmarried. Because unmarried people love God. But married people don't love God because they have to love their husbands or their wives or their families. No, that's obviously not what he's saying here in Corinthians. What is he saying? Well, the key is found in a verse in this very context. And that's why context is so important. He says, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. Now he's saying, I'm kind of speaking ad libly here when I notice that under the persecution, the heavy persecution that we have, where as sure as you're going to go out and witness or live for Christ, you are going to be arrested. You don't have any control over that. You're going to be kicked out. He was kicked out of his own hometown twice. One time they tried to throw him over the cliff in his hometown. That was Jesus Christ himself. So he said it's easier in times of extreme persecution for single people to navigate. Because if you're married, you have to also be concerned about a godly concern. Does God want husbands and wives to love each other? You bet he does. It's part of it. And so there is a godly concern that husbands and wives have, along with their godly concern to serve Christ. But in times of persecution, it's more challenging to do that as a family. Think of Moses, who they tried to raise during persecution. But at three months old, they decided they couldn't do that anymore. They couldn't keep the child hidden. And so it is very, think of the persecution in Bethlehem when Jesus told, when God told uh, Joseph and Mary to leave, uh, take the child down to Egypt. And so it's difficult to navigate. And Paul is saying that. Now, contextualism will show us. But if you're not careful, you can have a bunch of people thinking that singularity is a better way to serve God. Uh, and I'm thinking of people who have taken vows of singularity for their life so they could serve God even when there wasn't times of persecution. So he is basically in this chapter telling young people who are in love with each other, if they can hold off, to most certainly do that until the time of distress has passed. But if they can't hold off, then by all means marry. Now let's look at the same Greek word translated have care. It appears one time in 1 Corinthians 12, 25. He says, that there should be no schism in the body, the members should have the same care one for another. Is this a good care? Is this a care we ought to have? Yes, it is. So now we've seen cares we shouldn't have, and we've seen cares we should have. So how are we going to know which ones we should and which ones we shouldn't have? Well, context, of course, is the answer to this. And the same Greek word is translated care in Philippians 2.20. Paul says, when he's talking to the people at Philippi, he says, I really want to send Timothy your way as soon as I possibly can because I don't have any man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Paul is basically saying he doesn't know of anybody who cares for these people at Philippi like Timothy does. Wow. And so that was a godly concern. This is all the same word that is being used. And the same Greek word is translated careful in Luke 10, 41. Now, this is a favorite uh, of ladies' meetings. It's talking about Mary and Martha. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Do you remember the context? This was not something Martha should be doing. It's not okay to be a worker at the expense of sitting at the feet of Christ. It's not okay. So he contrasts this and says very bluntly to Martha, your sister Mary, you remember Martha was upset because Mary wasn't helping how? And Jesus said, Mary's chosen the best part. She is studying me. And guess what? This meal will be gone. The dishes will be gone. The house will be gone. But what she has with me, the fellowship, 
is eternal. She's chosen the better part, and it won't ever be taken away from her. Wow. So, what does this mean now, this word, merim na'o, in Philippians 4, 6? Be careful for nothing. Now, wait a minute. Timothy was careful about the church at Philippi, and that was okay. Mary was careful about sitting at Jesus' feet. But Martha, and that was wonderful, but Martha was careful about preparing the meal. That was not okay. Well, a man and a woman are careful for each other and also serving the Lord. And the believers in a church are to be careful one for the other. But we're not to be careful about the words we'll use to say uh, when arrested for doing the right thing. So we have to know from the context. Well, we know the context. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, instead of being worried about things, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So yes, I should have some concerns about some things. I should have changed this, going for the gold time, enrichment time. Read an article or two about slavery in the Roman Empire. You will be surprised. It was nothing like slavery in the United States. During the time of Christ and the Apostles, and then when you get finished, read the very, very short letter of Philemon with the article in mind, or the articles in mind. All right, you have a great Sunday. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray as we... Go through our day that we might take with us the word of God, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.